Welcome to another York College micro lecture. I'm Margaret Rose Vendries. I'm professor of art history here at York College and director of the Fine Arts Gallery. I've prepared for you an excerpt from a recent monograph that I wrote about the artist Richmond Barte's head of Josephine Baker. And so most of my uh, um, lecture is going to be images and you will hear my voice. Frida Josephine McDonald was a radical black feminist before that category even existed. By the age of 15, she had left the second of two husbands with two more marriages in her future. Richmond Barte, gay and a confirmed bachelor, was her contemporary. They probably knew of each other, but were personally unacquainted. Both had limited formal education. Baker was a live-in maid from seven years old. Barté, too, spent many years in domestic service. Barté eventually left New Orleans for art school in Chicago. Baker left St. Louis for the Paris stage. Both artists were successful because their talent and drive was extraordinary and they worked exceptionally hard. Baker's slim, flexible brown body became her professional currency. She immigrated to France, bared her breasts, and performed her way to fame and fortune. Her success coincided with the popularity in France of colonial postcards, picturing primitivist views of Africans just as Baker's Fatou in La Revue Negre imported U.S. jazz with echoes of Africa. By 1927, she was commanding the highest income for a performer in Europe and transformed into a marketable brand with a line of cosmetic products, including Baker Fix pomade. Her laminated hair went beyond the popular Marcel wave to a glistening immobile cap that could withstand gale winds. French society paid to see Baker's clowning and erotic choreography performed in steamy jungle settings. But the new Negro movement in the US working to displace Africa and its negative stereotypes placed Baker and Barté among those negative, those perpetuating negative stereotypes with their sexually charged art. Baker's story has a complexity and a sparkle that prompted biographies and film documentaries and docudramas. References to her career are included in scores of studies on the 20th century race relations. My favorite is the cover of Negrophilia, where Baker sits in a sequenced leotard, flashing her beguiling overbite smile and stroking her pet Chiquita. In the most recent documentary, Baker is remembered in all her diversity as the political, social, and artistic revolutionary who married four husbands, engaged in multiple affairs without race or gender discrimination, and in doing so, subverted stereotypes of Blacks and women. Barté's portrait of Baker with a partial spread of, of shoulders is just short of lifestyle, but appears much, much larger. Like her many fans, Barté was captivated by Baker's 1951 performance, which he memorializes here, but he was completely unaware of the challenges that came before it. Baker's 1936 U.S. tour with the Ziegfeld Follies left critics and audiences very disappointed. Within a year of returning to Paris, she officially became a French citizen and reinvented her stage persona once more. Then in 1947, Baker was back in New York City headlining at the Majestic in a show that was yet another box office flop. But that visit itself was a success because Baker found an enthusiastic audience in Fisk University students eager to hear her ideas about ending racial segregation. Baker enjoyed the company of young people. After miscarrying more than one pregnancy, she created a family through adoption. She purchased this imposing stone castle in southwestern France to raise her rainbow tribe of 12 children adopted from across the globe. By the time Barté's plans, by this time, 
Bartu's plans were already in place to emigrate to Jamaica, the island. He purchased a modest house, this one set back from a country road just outside of Ocho Rios. To finance this relocation, he accepted his largest and most ambitious public art commission for monumental figures for Haiti. The commission took over his studio practice for five years and only a few other pieces were made during that time. The fine head of Josephine Baker was among them. In 1951, Baker used her visibility to shake up systems of segregation by forcing US venues to sell tickets to her black fans. She agreed with fellow expatriate James Baldwin that, and I'm quoting, artists are here to disturb the peace and disturb she did. Barté recognized the transformation of Baker into an elegant black icon. She was fashion forward dramatic. She was sculpture in the flesh with hair that defied gravity. A black woman's hair is her crown and Baker nailed it in 1951. The stacked bouffant echoed both Africa and mid-century modernity. I'm reminded of Barté's 1934 portrait of a Mangbetu woman with her shaped head and long hair woven into a radiating halo. Baker's boldly modern coiffure dominates, but with a skeptic's gaze and pursed lips, her portrait speaks of defiance, perhaps even disgust with the immoral and an ethical treatment of black people in the United States. Unfortunately, Baker's 1951 visit turned dark when she publicly called out the famous Stork Club for racist discrimination when they refused to serve her party. As Baker stormed out past go gas gossip columnist Walter Rinchel, who I show you here, she loudly criticized him for not speaking out on her behalf. Winchell ended Baker's tour by labing, labeling her a communist in the morning paper. Baker would not sing before a US audience again. The last time Baker would visit the US was in 1963. That year, Barté turned 62 and renewed his appreciation for Africa in the slower pace and solitude of his new island home. This is one of the works he made while he was living in Jamaica. He left behind the growing civil rights movement that Baker returned to, to march on Washington that year in 1963, where she declared it to be the happiest day of her life as she spoke of racial equality in her heavily decorated French military uniform. Baker had been an informant for the French resistance during World War II. She was named a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, awarded the Croix de Guerre and the Medal of Resistance and given full military honors at her burial in 1975. The year Josephine Baker died, Barté spoke of his desire to see all races live together in peace, a desire Baker shared. They shouldered racism with dignity, treating people as individuals without prejudice and believed that art could change bad for the better. I very much want them to be right. Well, I'm doing this in February and it's Black History Month. Thank you for listening and celebrate Black history all year. Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. 
Did you want to see me broken, uh, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Eh, don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like a, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise.